Welcome to Autism ADHD TV. It is the place to be for parents and professionals. I'm your host, Holly Blanc Moses, the mom psychologist who gets it. We dive into all kinds of important information like behavior, social skills, and learning. All right, let's get started. Welcome, Meredith Dangle. Thank you for having me, Holly. I am thrilled that you're here, and we're going to talk about a very important topic, which is identifying depression in children with autism and or ADHD. But before we get started, I am going to introduce you to the audience. So you are a therapist who loves neurodiverse families and is passionate about helping clients recover their mental and emotional wellness, realize their worth, and build their resilience in order to live a life that's meaningful to them. Oh, I love that. You believe all lives tell beautiful stories, and it is your privilege to walk alongside clients as they write those stories. That's fantastic. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. That comes from a long, um, well, a first career in teaching, writing, and rhetoric, and also just loving stories since I was old enough to know what a story is. And I think that um, that's what makes us different from any other creature on earth is that we tell stories. We do. And, you know, there's something very lovely about sharing those and Mm -hmm. being able to connect with others and really in our work, there are a lot, that's our, our lives, right? We're sharing those stories of our lives. And, and so that's just, uh, it's a wonderful thing. So you and I both serve the population, um, of children diagnosed with autism and or ADHD. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you and I were chatting about the importance of identifying depression Mm -hmm. in this population and these populations. So really there's lots of studies out there telling us different things. You know, we, you can get a study showing 20% all the way up to 60% of children with ADHD who also meet criteria for the diagnosis of depression. You know, we can see anywhere from 10% to to 50% of children with autism diagnosed with depression. Um, So, you know, we see these over and over again. And I think now that, you know, the DSM had changed a while back to allow us to diagnose a child with both autism and ADHD. So I think we're going to see more um, research coming out of depression in children diagnosed with both. But right now, you know, that's kind of where we are. There's a big big, you know, gap there between 20 and 60%. But the point is that it's happening. And so it's something that we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. And you and I both know as therapists, it is hard sometimes to figure out what depression is in this population, because sometimes we're going to see some overlapping symptoms. Yeah. Symptoms where we traditionally think of depression may not present in the same way mm-hmm. for children um, with autism and or ADHD. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Let's do it. Um, yeah. So what I've learned really is that so many, well, like you were saying, so many of the symptoms overlap, right? If, if you have major depressive disorder or um, or having depressive symptoms, folks can mistake those for, oh, it's just autism. But that's an autism diagnosis. You know, the um, rigid thinking, trouble sleeping, maybe problems with eating, irritability, things that we tend to go, oh, that's just their autism. Um, When really they could also be experiencing depression. And so folks that maybe don't have the specialized knowledge that you and I do um, aren't going to pick up on that. And it really takes someone who can hone in on those nuances of the two diagnoses and maybe a really perceptive parent or teacher um, to realize that both things are going on. Absolutely. And so, like you said, you know, we think of depression as in a child laying in bed. Right. And not saying anything. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, um, being very sad, possibly you know, uh, making comments about suicide, Mm -hmm. um, 
sleeping, you know, much more than they did before. So it is definitely different. And when you say, oh, then, you know, they are having some sleep disturbance, appetite differences and social withdrawal. I mean, that really makes it a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. Like, like you said, what is, what is maybe how they're presenting as an autistic child versus, you know, experiencing depression, because we don't want to miss that. It's just too, it's too important. Right. Um, I would say that I don't, I don't know what your experience is, but doing this, and this is my whole, you know, you said your second sort of um, career now. Mm -hmm. Um, This is my like, like old time career, (laughs) back, back 23 years now. And so, you know, I would say many of the children that I've served and young adults have experienced symptoms of depression. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that we have to look at how are those symptoms that we think of as autism symptoms or ADHD symptoms, how have they changed? You know, if you're seeing increased social withdrawal or you're seeing changes in their appetite, like maybe they already had issues with certain foods, but that's even changed or the sleeping problems or um, problems, you know, with communicating. That's a huge one too. Have they always been really verbal and now they're not communicating with words so much? Um, If they haven't communicated with words ever, you know, now are we seeing different behaviors um, that may speak to their depression? So for me, you know, you have to really look at baseline and then how, is that different now? Um, Which I think is really hard to do if you're not paying really close attention. Um, I know even for me, I mean, I should should have said up front, uh, my 12 year old is autistic. He was diagnosed when he was three. And even as somebody who studied this extensively, like I really have to be paying attention to, okay, maybe he's always withdrawn from certain things, but now he's withdrawing from things that he loves. That's not normal for him. Um, You know, so for me, it's just taking a look at what has changed over time. Absolutely. And, and I think that is probably the number one thing to consider. And like you said, really noticing and it doesn't have to be this massive change all of a sudden. That's right. I mean, it could be this gradual change, which makes it even more tricky, I think. Agreed. Agreed. I, I noticed this past year, the pandemic, right? Um, it's not like a switch got turned and all of a sudden people were more depressed. But you really had to watch how things progressed over the course of weeks and and months. And that's harder to do. Just like when um, other people see our children and they haven't seen them in a long time, they're like, oh, they got so big. They've grown so tall. And you're going, really? (laughs) So I think when things happen slowly, it's so much easier to miss it. Whereas someone who, you know, hasn't seen your child in a while goes, hmm, things are different now. And so again, that's why you have to be so tuned in and it's, it's easy to miss. It can be for sure. Mm-hmm. And what gets, we were talking earlier about how these sort of symptoms overlap and, yeah. you know, we can see, you know, some depressive symptoms sometimes you'll see in children with ADHD is mm-hmm. more impairment socially. And sure. a lot of these children already struggle with mm-hmm. social differences, mm-hmm. um, academic functioning you know, we can see some differences there and they're already may struggle with, you know, executive functioning, but also, you know, learning disabilities occur much more in children with ADHD. And so they're already experiencing those differences. And like you said, here we have, again, on top of that, noticing the changes. That's right. So looking at baseline and looking at the other parts of that, We might see, and this this sounds almost a little unbelievable, but, you know, we might even see some increase in hyperactivity or inattention. (laughs) They may already struggle with those things, but again, a change in that presentation, Mm -hmm. definitely. Um, So what I find in children with autism is sometimes I'll see some increased obsessionality. 
kind of um, also, you know, not only sometimes losing interest in those big special interests that they have, but almost turning it up. Yes, or with new things. Yes. With something different that may not even be adaptive. You know, something that's actually harmful or um, uh, gets them stuck in a negative thinking pattern. I've, I've seen that as well. Definitely. Mm -hmm. We might see some, and the same with ADHD as well, some somatic complaints where, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. they're, they're describing um, and maybe words that don't make sense for us necessarily, but my muscles feel, you know, tingly or, you know, I mean, anything like that where they're describing something feels different. Maybe there are headaches, maybe there are body aches, maybe there are stomach aches, anything like that. If that's another thing to, again, notice if, you, if there's a change there. Right. Yeah. I've definitely heard stomach aches and headaches, a lot of that, or just, I just feel sick. I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but I just feel sick. Um, right. And taking that very seriously, because when you have difficulty communicating something in a way that the listener can understand, it can be not easy, but you know, a lot of us don't feel well sometimes. Um, right. And because they may not be describing it clearly, doesn't mean that's not happening. Exactly. Right. Right. So we just have to make sure that we're, we're definitely paying attention mm -hmm. to those differences. You may see an increase in self-injury. Yes. If a child maybe is, you know, every once in a great while will engage in self-injury that may we may see an increase in that maybe even in aggression mm -hmm, mm -hmm. definitely I was sharing with you um last week about the um the the young man that i read about in a study who did not communicate with words um never had self-injurious behaviors and then all of a sudden he was banging his head on the desk or banging his head on the wall um, everyday skills like toileting and hygiene, all of those things started to regress. And because of the head banging, um, they first tried medications for aggression. That didn't change anything. And then when they tried um, uh, antidepressant, he went back to exactly the way he used to be and no more head banging and no more aggression and his adaptive skills came back. And it was like, whoa. Um, you know, that's what it was. The, the head banging, the self injurious behavior didn't just come out of nowhere for no reason. This, this fellow was really depressed and didn't know how to communicate that to the people that care about him. Uh, and I'm so glad that they were able to support that person. Yes. because I mean, it, it really is such a challenge. And even when you do have maybe the words to express, and here's the listener that can understand the words that you're saying, mm -hmm. um, you know, we often miss that even in neurotypical people. So I think mm -hmm. that it makes it so much more difficult. And we just, again, have to pay extra, extra attention. Mm -hmm. Something I'm wondering in your experience too, for those who do communicate with words that, um, or an augmentative device, mm -hmm. I'll hear an increase in self talk. Yes. Negative self-talk for sure. Absolutely. Negative self-talk. And so, um, it would be, you know, I'll never have any friends. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I never get anything right. I'll mm -hmm. always yeah. fail. And it's really this, this hopelessness. Absolutely. I, I've heard a lot. I'm just a failure. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. It's, and it's, um, the longer it goes on, the more it perpetuates and sort of solidifies in their mind that they're a failure. You know, the longer that the depression goes on, the more that they feel like they can't accomplish things. That's almost like evidence for them. Yet, obviously, I'm a failure, you know, and um, all of us around them, of course, don't believe that. But that's what their minds are telling them. Like, well, clearly, I can't get anything right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And and so what's what's so hard as well is they're the signals they're getting from the environment can really play into that. Um, you know, I messed up the other day, like I always talk, <laughs> I always talk on here that yes, I, I'm, 
you know, specialize in this area, but I make mistakes too. Yeah. I get, I'm a human person. <laughs> That's right. And um, I had asked my son, who's autistic, my oldest son to take out the garbage. And then I also said, while he was doing that, which is awesome, by the way, that's something that that's we had right. been working on um, while he was doing that. And I was like, and also please take out your bathroom garbage. So it was a kitchen garbage and he started screaming, oh. you know, that's too much. And I thought, oh my gosh, yes, it was right. And like, I can't do that. I can't, I won't get it right. And, and I thought, well, that was actually built on my hurrying up to remind myself Yes. Not so much <laughs> remind him, but the way it came out was I was just peppering him with right. expectations and he was worried, you know, and then that turned around to be, I'm not going to get it right. Absolutely. And I, yeah. And I think that again, there are those expectations or those um, way the, you know, most neurotypical world presents. Right. in this way and so then you find yourself I mean all of us compare ourselves to others it's a very human thing but when you notice you're sitting in class and everyone else is getting it but you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or you are so upset you know I was serving someone the other day and they were crying because they wish so much that they could get better grades like the other kids oh, yeah and it just it's so hard Right. Them because this world is mostly not built for them yet. They're comparing themselves to people that, you know, it's, it's kind of apples and oranges Yeah, and they're thinking that something is wrong with them because they're not meeting maybe all of these expectations that again, are not built for them in the first place. Exactly. It's constant reminder of I'm different. Clearly there's something wrong with me. You know, I don't fit into this Apple world because I'm an orange. Right. Yeah, it's just a constant um, reminder. And of course, there's nothing wrong with being different. But when you're, especially if you're a teenager, you know, nobody wants to be different. <laughs> As a nobody. Yeah. And they're just getting this constant reminder from their environment that they are different at a time when they so want to fit in. Um, I'll never forget my son who, you know, I think is very bright. Of course, I'm his mom, right? <laughs> he came home from school one day and said, I'm not in the smart reading group. And my heart just broke into a million pieces. He's been reading since he was three years old. And yet he didn't get put in a certain group. And all of a sudden he thought he wasn't smart. And it just it just killed me. And I know that happens to more people than just my son. I know there's so many kids in school who feel like they didn't get picked for uh, a team at recess or they didn't get put in the right reading group or, you know, Sally doesn't want to be friends with me and Johnny makes fun of me. And suddenly they're really feeling bad about themselves. And like you said, that increase in negative self-talk really points to, okay, maybe there's a change going on here in their mental health that I really should be looking at. Absolutely. So it really comes down to, again, you know, we, we mention why it can be hard to recognize depression in these children. And of course we need to, because that's, you know, it, it, like you said earlier, and you said it so well, is it sticks around and then becomes our our self-worth, you know, this, this, this statement just comes in so easily, unfortunately. And I think all of us, no matter what have, I'm, I'm not good enough story. I mean, we all do. <laughs> That's right. We do all do. I definitely do. I'm sure you do. Everyone <laughs> listening has, I'm not good enough story and we carry it into adulthood. Mm -hmm. But I think it's times 5,000 mm -hmm. when it comes to these kids. That's because right. they're getting stop signs all the mm -hmm. time from the environment, from everyone in it all day long. Yeah. One of the um, really cool things, and this is talking about adults more than children, but one of the really interesting things I read about them is that they feel like a lot of mental health practitioners don't even believe them when they're saying that they're having these mental health, mental health issues. Um, they get a lot, well, you look like you're doing so well. And <laughs> just because they're functioning really highly 
doesn't mean that they can't be depressed or they can't be anxious. Um, so, I mean, that's, it's so sad, but I also found it really interesting that even adults who can articulate their problems are not being believed because we have this idea of how they should look and how they should present. Absolutely. And so that's why it's so important that you and I are talking about this today, because, you know, um, we also know that, you know, adults, again, will suffer from depression and various times of their lives. You know, a lot of us do. Mm -hmm. And it is something that you just, you don't talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we don't talk about that. We're supposed to be all okay. Um, last week I did an episode on, you may have listened to it, but was pretending to be fine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we all do it to some extent, but I think it is just so much more with this population. I mean, oftentimes we'll hear autistic adults um, and teens talking about masking and, yeah. you know, um, and we all do this to an extent, but it's so, so much more for them. And, you know, you have to pretend you're fine. You, you mm -hmm. have to pretend that you're not depressed and, mm -hmm. you know, all these other things. So, you know, again, hopefully this episode is, will shine a light on the importance of understanding and identifying depression because it can be treated. And that's the beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. But first we have to be paying attention, understanding those changes, um, noticing those changes. And believe them. When and they believe them, them. yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. We, I mean, who knows someone better than them, their own self, right? I mean, we feel that way. So why wouldn't someone with ADHD or autism feel that way? And so we just have to validate and believe what they're saying. And I think sometimes that's the biggest challenge. Absolutely. Uh, well, I know a lot of our listeners and watchers are going to want to contact you. So why don't you tell us how they can do that? Yeah, thank you. So my website is Meredith M. Dangle and Dangle is spelled D-A-N-G-E-L. So I always tell everybody not like the verb. Um, so MeredithMDangle.com <laughs> and you can find me on Instagram at Meredith Dangle Counseling. Perfect. Mara, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me on. It was great. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining me today. Don't forget to click that subscribe button so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like this episode, please share it with someone. It may just be what they need to watch today. If you're a parent, I'd love if you came on over and joined our Facebook group, Autism ADHD Group for Parents. If you're a therapist or educator, come on over to our group, Autism ADHD Group for Therapists and Educators. You're going to find those links right down there in the notes. Thanks so much, and I can't wait to see you in the next episode. All content provided is protected under applicable copyright, patent, trademark, and other proprietary rights. All content is provided for informational and educational purposes only. No content is intended to be a substitute for professional medical or psychological diagnosis, advice, or treatment. Information provided does not create an agreement for service between Holly Blanc Moses, Crossvine Clinical Group, the interviewee, Holly Blanc Moses, LLC, and the recipient. Consult your physician regarding the applicability of any opinions or recommendations with respect to your symptoms or medical condition or the symptoms or medical condition of your family member. Children or adults who show signs of dangerous behavior toward themselves and or others should be placed immediately under the care of a qualified professional.